So the portion of trips in the downtown area made by car are well under 20%, probably less than 10%. And yet the majority of road space is dedicated to automobile parking and travel. And you can see in the, these images that the roads are hardly used, that, that space is not used efficiently and the sidewalks are actually quite crowded and often uncomfortable because transportation planners have dedicated the majority of road space and the majority of their funding to accommodating automobile travel, even when it makes no sense whatsoever. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman, and that is Todd Littman with the Victoria Transport Policy Institute up in Victoria, British Columbia. We're gonna be diving into some of his research work and his publications. Uh, it's a long one, but it's a good one, so let's get right to it with Todd. Todd Littman, it's wonderful to have you back on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you very much. So, Todd, I love to have my guests uh, just to give a real quick 30-second uh, uh, introduction. Uh, so, who is Todd Littman? Uh, I am executive director of the Victoria Transport Policy Institute. I've spent the last 30 years or so working on what I call innovative or emerging transportation planning issues. I love it. I love it. And uh, I, I'm. it's delightful to welcome you back because this is your second time on the podcast, first time on the video version of it. Uh, but you and I have actually, uh, this is actually, believe it or not, you may not know this, but this is your third time, uh, you know, on the Active Towns channel because I also uh, recorded a video with you there in Victoria because that's where you're located. You're in Victoria, BC. That's right. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And in fact, when we uh, met uh, in person and, uh, and and I recorded that video with you, that was part of a tour that you were leading. It was a bike tour that you were leading for the Congress for the New Urbanism. I want to say that was in 2017. Does that seem about right to you? Right. I would have to go back to my notes to be sure, but that yeah. sounds about right. Yeah, it, 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 and uh, you, you looked a lot younger then. Uh, there you are. <laughs> so yeah, you were you were gracious enough to to actually take us uh, on a tour um, there in Victoria, uh, British Columbia, and uh, and really sort of showing off some of the extraordinary bicycle infrastructure. And then we were talking about uh, land use planning, and we were also talking about you know the the, the importance of, you know, creating sociable networks and sociable communities. Talk a little bit about, uh, you know, Victoria, BC, it's your, been your home for a while. And it, are there any updates that, you know, to you know, sort of what we are the, the spirit of what we were covering when we were, uh, you know, touring around in Victoria? Absolutely. Uh, we have actually, we, we just completed, uh, of five, every five year travel survey, that is the, the regional government commissioned a major survey, commissions a, reg, a major survey every five years. And they just released the 2022. And the results are actually really encouraging. So um, uh, for example, we saw a, a, a large increase in walking and bicycling mode share and a very significant reduction in automobile travel. So automobile trips are down, walking and bicycling are up. Uh, this did occur, you know, at the tail end, the, the travel survey occurred at the tail end of the, this little pandemic that we had. And so uh, uh, transit ridership did not increase, but it didn't decline nearly as much as we saw in a lot of other cities around the world. Uh, and I think that that uh, validates the investments that our city has made in in non-auto travel, and the the uh, we're also doing a lot of infill development. So we're encouraging more housing. We're creating more housing in the walkable urban neighborhoods, and that demonstrates that uh, what seems like a small increase in walking and bicycling can actually reflect a pretty large 
reduction in automobile travel, that there is a leverage effect, that if we create more walkable neighborhoods, what I like to call urban villages, we do see uh, the reduction in driving, a, a fairly significant reduction in driving. Yeah, yeah. And and you were actually you know, talking a little bit about this in this video that's sort of rolling in the background here. One of the things that you had talked about was, you know, that that concept of these urban villages. And, you know, maybe if they maybe somebody does need to drive into it and maybe they park, but then park and then go and do many other little trips as well. That's right. Uh, what we find is that when we create a truly accessible multimodal neighborhood where it's easy to get around without a lot of driving, that people take advantage of that opportunity. And it comes out in many ways. These days, I, I really uh, uh, love using walk score as an indicator of a well-designed community. Interesting thing is that walk score doesn't really measure walking or walkability. It doesn't measure sidewalks or crosswalks, but it does measure land use mix the, and density, the number of commonly used destinations that you can reach within what's considered a walkable distance. And that turns out to be really key. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the, I'm glad you brought that up is that it's really looks looks at density and, and proximity of meaningful destinations within a particular neighborhood. To your point, though, it doesn't get into any qualitative analysis of whether the sidewalks are actually safe or, you know, whether, you know, it's it's truly a uh, pleasant environment necessarily, but at least proximity is there. Well, I'll be sure to include the link uh, to this video uh, in the show notes uh, for this episode uh, down below. So folks who are listening to this, uh, you'll want to definitely pop on over to the, uh, the landing page uh, for this episode out at activetowns.org uh, or in the show notes uh, on your listening platform. And those of you here on YouTube, you can just click on the video description down below and you can get the, the link to that video and you can watch the entire thing. And here's some of the, the wisdom that was coming out uh, way back in 2017 uh, from Todd. And, uh, I, and I, I also wanted to, to uh, give you an opportunity to talk a little bit more about uh, the Victoria Transport Policy Institute. I established VTPI in 1993, so the, the past millennium. Uh, and uh, amazingly, it's been my uh, consulting firm and research platform. And amazingly, uh, it has continued all that time. I've been able to find really interesting research projects for the last 30 plus years. Yeah. So why don't you go ahead and, and explain a little bit more about that? How does one uh, start up their their own, you know, dating way back to the 1990s? And and uh, uh, and, and yes, you, this is your website. And we were sort of poking fun at you a couple weeks ago uh, that. The, the website does look a little bit like it's from the 1990s, but it is a treasure trove of resources. Uh, but talk a little bit about that. How does one go about creating a career out of doing this sort of work, the research that you do and the publications that you do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I started off uh, doing research for my master's thesis, looking at the costs and benefits, how to, how to apply economic analysis to different forms of transportation. And my work expanded on the scope. So a few previous studies had looked at certain aspects of these impacts. So some studies looked at infrastructure costs. You know, what does it cost to provide roads and sidewalks and bike lanes? And other studies looked at the environmental impacts. You know, how do uh, air pollution and noise and and uh, land use impacts vary between different forms of transportation. And others looked at consumer costs or parking costs, but uh, there were very few studies that tried to pull all that together. That was my master's thesis. And so as I was completing it, I started getting consulting contracts. And after a couple of these contracts and getting some interest uh, and getting paid, 
for doing that, I, I took the risk, established VTPI as my, as my research uh, organization and consulting firm. And amazingly, uh, over the, I, I have been able to get work and funded work that allowed me to focus on this. Uh, I'm very lucky that if I, uh, because I have low overhead, I've been able to mi minimize my overhead. I'm able to uh, to get by if I if I have a relatively modest amount of paid work each month or each year. It took a while, so it was a decade of really struggling, and I was supporting a family of four at the time, and at that time it. It, it often seemed uh, risky, and every time I got a good contract, I'd call it my little miracle. Another miracle came through. Uh, there are all kinds of complications if you're your own small-scale consultant, things like you're spending a lot of time lining up contracts, putting in bids. You know, it's the nature of the, the person that's hiring you. They generally like at least three and as many as 10 bids on any contract, which means that if you're, if you're working as a consultant, you usually need to submit uh, three to 10 proposals for each one you get successful, each one that gets selected. So as a consultant, you spend a lot of time preparing proposals, knowing that most of them you're going to fail. It also requires me to do my own, you know, accounting and uh, administrative work and a document layout. And, um, and there's often quite a lag between when I complete a project and when I, when I get paid for it. Uh, it's typical that, you know, you do some work and you submit an invoice and maybe a month later, you actually get a check or a wire transfer. But there's often there's some kind of little technical glitch in the uh, in the money transfer or something like that. And it can easily be two or three months. So if you're going to set yourself up as a co consultant, uh, you just need to be aware. You've got to, you've got to have, you, you're, you're running a business. Yeah. Now uh, I've been lucky that uh, the areas that I'm interested in tend to be emerging issues, uh, issues that are getting more attention over time. And so my interest, I often, if there's a, a new issue that, that interests me, and I don't, as far as I can see, there's not a lot of other researchers working on it, I'll take some time. I'll often spend a week or two weeks or more uh, doing research on that subject and, and developing my own analysis of, of how we could do a better job, how communities or Governments could do a better job or businesses could do a better job of addressing that issue. And those are unfunded, what I call unfunded projects. I just do them because I'm interested. And if I'm lucky, uh, that will become somebody else. Some Somebody will find reasons to hire me to do more research on that subject. And that's been my my med, mat, met method for the last few years, last few decades, and amazingly, it has worked. So I I sometimes uh, get those miracles where something that I'm interested in turns out to have some uh, broader interest. Yeah, fantastic. And as we can see, this is the landing page for season one, episode 33, when uh, we last spoke uh, at, in depth. And uh, I really do encourage everybody to go and listen to this one. This is an audio only uh, podcast and uh, podcast episode. And again, there's the, a link to that particular video that we were just looking at. And yeah, it, it, it really is amazing. You have been one of the mainstays of doing research uh, in this particular area. Now, if I remember correctly, you probably tried to attend the, uh, the Transportation Research Board uh, meetup. Did, were you there last week? Absolutely, yes. Fantastic. So, uh, yeah. this, this, from what I can estimate... Uh, this is either my 30th or 31st year of attending. 
Uh, for me, it's great fun because I get to see uh, the emerging research that other people are doing and see lots of old friends and make new ones. Uh, the Transportation Research Board, it's a section of the National Academy of Sciences. So there's a lot of resources being invested there. And then there are some fun side uh, events like the transportation camp, where uh, the generally young, uh, me, exclu me ex the exception, but a lot of young people come together with a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and curiosity and discuss these important emerging issues. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I'm going to pull up your, your LinkedIn page because you, you, you do post a fair amount of stuff out on LinkedIn and keep us, you know, posted of some of the stuff that you're doing. And it, it occurs to me that, yeah, you actually did post about uh, the TRB because you were, as you were there. And uh, one of the things that you had mentioned in that is uh, your joy of, uh, you know, going through and walking through the poster sessions and oftentimes at conferences and meetups, those are one of the things that, you know, it's like, oh yeah, don't forget about going through the poster sessions. Uh, talk a little bit about that and why those poster sessions are so impactful and important uh, from your perspective. Sure. Uh, let's put this into perspective. Researchers are working on something that they're excited about. And then in July, we submit our abstracts or our, what, what we, we submit papers to present at this conference six months later. And if we're lucky, we, you know, some of our papers get accepted. In the past, most of the presentations were what, we're, what we call a panel presentation. You sit at a table with other researchers and you've got 15 minutes or so to present your research. And in practice, if you're attending one of those sessions, very likely you're only interested in one or two of the presentations, but you're stuck in that room. You have to sit through the other ones that you might not be interested in at all. And to tell you the truth, some presenters are not very good at giving a, an in, at making an interesting story. They might have a fantastic research, but sometimes sitting through 15 minutes of somebody's either I'm not interested in it or I'm not impressed with how they're presenting the information. And it's fairly time demanding for everybody to sit in those rooms and watch these presentations. Yeah. If I can jump in real quick, Todd. So what you're really saying is that the one of the beautiful things about this is just this. We're looking at the image on here and you have the ability to sort of walk around scan that research. And if you have additional questions, there's usually times when uh, the poster presenters are there and then you can have a one-on-one -on -one sort of Q&A with them about the context of that, that presentation. Exactly. Exactly. So over time, uh, there just wasn't, there weren't enough slots in the, in the, in the panel sessions. So what's happened over time is an increasing portion of the papers are now presented as poster in the poster sessions. And this photo doesn't really give justice to this huge scale of this thing. You're in a giant hall uh, with, at any one point, there's probably about a hundred or more uh presentations being presented. And they're in sections. So there might be one of these aisles is focusing on, say, economic analysis, and another is on model transportation modeling, and another is on is on um, emerging uh, or somebody's working on public transit or walkability or something else. And there'll be poster after poster. Um, and like you say, you walk through and you look at the heading and you look at, you can, I typically will spend um, uh, 10 seconds assessing whether I'm at all interested in this thing. And then if I am, I'll spend a minute reading through, uh, and there's kind of a standard format. There's an abstract that summarizes it. There's graphs uh, showing, you know, key analysis, and then there's conclusions and findings. So um, in 10 seconds, I can usually determine whether I'm interested in the subject. And in a minute, I can get the key findings. And then the fun thing is that the author 
is there. And if I have questions or I'm really excited or, or if I disagree with them and think that their, their research is biased or incomplete, I can tell them that to their face. And it is, it is actually, uh, in practice, it's generally much more fun than sitting in one of these panel sessions. So uh, I, I like to do it. It's often the younger researchers uh, uh, often a good portion of them are, let's say, a student is presenting their dissertation or thesis findings or or something. Uh, there's uh, so so I find it great fun. It's a it's a really good activity at a conference. I'm I've I've honed in on this particular photo. This is another one of your photos that you uh, had posted out on social media. And uh, I, 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 I chuckled when I saw this particular photo uh, because I, and you'll see why I chuckled about it because I have another one that I'll that I'll pop on over to. Um, but before I give you my take as to why I find this funny, um, what was your sort of thought when you were framing this shot and taking a, a snapshot of it? Well, it is kind of fun. It partly it just shows, uh, what the conference center is like. Uh, this is the Washington, D.C. conference center. And uh, there are s probably about 14,000 transportation researchers attending this conference. The scale is astounding. Wow. 14,000. Wow. And, um, that is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's a lot going on. But it is kind of fun to be an active transportation uh, advocate. I, I like walking and bicycling. And to see how quickly, if there's an escalator, people who are, uh, who, who would normally uh, walk and bicycle, uh, they just go suck, they get sucked into it. So one of my, um, one of my uh, conference and travel day uh, physical activity strategies is that whenever there's a stairs, I'll take them rather than the escalator or the elevator. Uh, um, so this, uh, you know, I look at these stairs, beautiful stairs, beautiful carpet. Um, but uh, even though, you know, there's an irony here, a lot of those people would probably go and work out at a gym Right. In order to be stay there, <laughs> maintain their exercise, uh, when the escalator is there, you just, without thinking, wander onto it. Yeah, you you you, you, think, went, you 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 took my my bait. You know, I was uh, I was you knew which what direction I was going. This particular image is courtesy of uh, Darren Buck, who was also in attendance uh, there at the uh, at TRB, and uh, and and yeah, it's. It's one of those things that we we know about human behavior is that you know we we tend to gravitate towards the easy way, up and down, and uh, it's it's always quite uh, amazing, and it, it's it's good for a little little poking fun at uh, as well. Uh, I do the same thing as you do, is I I go out of my way to you know find those stairs. In this case, the stairs and the escalators are literally right next to each other. And so it is an even uh, more interesting sort of uh, uh, illustration of human behavior and how we do gravitate towards the easy way up. Well, it's also a reminder of, of design. Yes. We, if, if we want to encourage active uh, lifestyles, the stairs should be more prominent and more attractive than the escalator and elevator. And this is an issue, for example, in designing office buildings and hospitals and other, other facilities is often the escalator and elevator are the prominent. And if there are stairs, you have to go out of your way and it's uh, a lot of the stairwells are ugly. They just, there's they, no, no, nobody's bothered to, design them to be attractive. They're sometimes dark and dirty. So if we do want to be healthier, there's some just little design features. You could call the, uh, those, you know, your extra exercise, you could call them a, a exercise snack. And you could call designing, you know, giving prominence to the, to the healthier option, 
you could call that a nudge. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And in this case, you know, they're both side by side. Uh, like you said, you, you pointed out that they're, they were quite attractive and certainly inviting and right there. So proximity was there. Uh, but it does, uh, you know, kind of speak to the fact that, yeah, we, we have to kind of think a little bit more appropriately about, well, how do we sort of nudge people towards that active mobility choice? And it's easy for us to, to, sort of extend this uh, analogy that we're that we're using here uh, towards our cycle networks and our walking networks that we have out in our cities. How can we encourage more active mobility? And we may have to take into consideration not only proximity and, and make it obvious, but also make it you know, truly enjoyable and pleasurable uh, for people to choose to walk or bike. Sure. Comes up in many circumstances. So uh, frequently, the the implication is we're doing somebody a favor by minimizing the amount that they have to walk. I especially notice it in airports where there'll often be a shuttle bus of some sort from one terminal to another. And in a lot of cases, they don't even give you the option of walking, even though if you take into account the time you waste waiting for that shuttle and then you're crammed into a unpleasant, you know, crap, a little pod of some sort. If they had a, a walking corridor option, I would certainly choose it, you know, half the time or, you know, most of the time, unless I'm in a rush. So and and there are countless examples of when the just the, the design details discourage people from using the physical activity active option. Yeah, yeah. So I've pulled up on screen here uh, your most recent uh, article that you uh, have published in Planetizen. And, uh, and, and again, I, it, 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 I think is, is appropriate for us to, to emphasize that as part of the research that, that you do and the work that you do, you are constantly publishing. Uh, and so this is just the most recent, uh, you know, published uh, just, you know, a, a few days ago on uh, January 8th, 2024. Uh, talk a little bit about this particular publication and what you are covering. Sure. Well, Planetism is the website for professional planners. It's used by people all over the world, but it is, you know, North American uh, focus in practice. Sustainable transportation hierarchies come up frequently. It is part of what you would call the paradigm shift from uh, focusing on speed. So automobile transportation, policies that favor automobile transportation are justified because driving is generally faster than walking and bicycling in public transit. And so for the last century, we've created, a, we've reinforced a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we put most of our planning resources into uh, roads and parking facilities. We are, we are essentially favoring and subsidizing automobile travel at a much higher rate than we do the, the what you could call the affordable, inclusive, resource-efficient modes like walking and bicycling and public transit. So uh, occasionally planners uh, realize that, that we need to reprioritize. And a term that we use is a sustainable transportation hierarchy. Now, if you can go down on, the, um, on the, the, my uh, blog here, you'll see uh, that other researchers have developed, there's a number of images of these sustainable hierarchy images, but basically it says, that when there's some resources are being allocated, whether it's money or road space or time, we should favor the affordable, efficient modes. And this uh, image, it, it illustrates why. Uh, you could say that you know driving a car uh, requires far more space and so is far less appropriate in urban conditions and requires far more expensive infrastructure than walking and bicycling in public transit. You, if you're an environmentalist focusing on environmental impacts, you could say that automobile travel produces far more uh, emissions, you know, requires far more uh, energy and reduces and produces more emissions. Uh, so there are a number of these, uh, uh, these uh, images that to convey that. My research has been to go into the, into much more detail. So, uh, I come up with um, estimates of the, 
the, the specific estimates of the, the infrastructure costs and the cost to consumers of different modes, uh, the accident risk that different modes impose, the pollution, the, 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 the imp, uh, impervious surface they require, so the amount of land that has to be paved for roads and parking facilities. So I do uh, um, more multifaceted analysis, but the results are, the conclusions are very consistent that walking, bicycling, and public transit tend to be more affordable, inclusive, and efficient. Okay, so then you go down and you ask, well, what, what should that, how should we apply that to something like funding allocation? So if you go down a little bit more in my blog, you'll see one of my graphs here where I ask how much, what portion of our infrastructure dollars uh, do we typically spend on walking and bicycling and public transit, not uh, non-auto modes? And it turns out to be in a typical community, probably about 10% or less of our transportation dollars are spent on, on non-auto modes. And then you can compare that with demand for those modes. How much do people want to use walking and bicycling and public transit? And you can compare it with total trips, traffic deaths, urban trips. So the trips in urban areas that where traffic congestion and accident risk and air pollution are most significant and where the benefits of reduced driving uh, would be greatest, uh, potential trips, and frequent users. So there's some surveys that ask people, do you use non-auto modes at least three times a week? And it turns out, yeah, about half, even though the commonly used statistics say that 90% uh, of trips are made by, by automobile uh, you can invert that and you can say about half of the population uh, relies on walking and bicycling in public transit at least occasionally, at least three times a week. And so you can say they're users, they're frequent users. And of course, a lot of those, some of those are, are totally dependent. They're people who cannot drive or should not drive. And so the, the quality of non-auto travel becomes a critical issue in their uh, ability to access critical services and activities, whether they can get to work or school or they can go shopping or get to health care depends on the quality of non-auto travel. So anyway, my conclusion is that uh, our current practices greatly under-invest in non-auto travel. Now, these images come from my recent trip to China, and we stopped in Hong Kong uh, when we arrived and returned. And look at these images of a Hong Kong street where this is a city, this is one of the densest and one of the largest and densest cities in the world. And it has a very low automobile mode share. So the portion of trips in the downtown area made by car are well under 20%, probably less than 10%. And yet the majority of road space is dedicated to automobile parking and travel, and you can see in the, these images that the roads are hardly used. That that space is not used efficiently, and the sidewalks are actually quite crowded and often uncomfortable because transportation planners have dedicated the majority of road space and the majority of their funding to accommodating automobile travel, even when it makes no sense whatsoever. It's a it's just the way. Uh, transportation planners and transportation agencies function these days, they're biased in favor of spending dollars on automobile tra motorized travel to the detriment of non-auto travel. Yeah. And then there, it also has implications for community design. I emphasize the value, the benefits that come from living in a multimodal community, a community where you don't need to drive and where walking and bicycling in public transit are normal and efficient and convenient. And the easiest uh, way to measure this that I find is this walk score. Uh, here's an example of walk score in Nashville. And basically green means a walk score of over 70, which means that you probably could get it by quite conveniently without having a car. If, you're, if, you're, if you don't own a car, you can't afford a car, or you have a physical disability that prevents you from driving, the best advice uh, I can give is make sure you live in a neighborhood that has a walk score at least 70 
and that you are you have good shoes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's fascinating too, to your point that you were just talking about about the the arrogance of space uh, that the you know the transportation planning has had with regards to the automobile and it's like, well, now we see it now, especially like in Hong Kong, you can see just how, uh, out of shape it is, but there's so much sunk costs that in terms of it, you know, we've invested this in the automobile. It's so difficult for them to then be able to give that up. There's a lot of like biases, like you had said, uh, you know, that's sort of baked into that as well as, you know, just saying, well, no, 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 we can't, we can't, go back or whatever. We can't expand the pedestrian realm uh, to take over this space. Uh, so there's a lot of resistance, but it makes it a little bit more, I think, powerful and impactful when researchers such as yourself are like pointing this out and, and being able to illustrate just how out of sync it is with what reality is. Well, uh, I'm maybe a little bit more of an optimist. I like to look on the positive side of these issues. And yes, in my one of my recent studies that looks at uh, planning distortions, it does point out that conventional planning, it basically allocates funding based on travel speed. The assumption is that faster is better. So faster modes are better than slower modes. And anything that reduces uh, speed, so traffic congestion, is bad and is a problem to be solved. And our funding is allocated based on overcoming any delay and increasing speed. So that's been going on for the last century. And it is embedded in the planning process. The performance indicators that transportation agencies use are strongly oriented they fa- they're based on maximizing speed and reducing delay. That's what the performance indicators uh, uh, emphasize. But on the other hand, there's plenty of good evidence that transportation system users, that's you and me, are recognizing the value of non-auto travel. So, for example, the National Association of, of uh, Realtors has has commissioned a series of consumer studies, studies asking people, what type of neighborhood do you want to live in? And what type of home and what type of neighborhood? And if you have no constraints, uh, you know, 80% of people say, yeah, I want to live in a a single family house on a big lot. You know, I want the typical suburban house. But if you give them realistic trade-offs and you say, okay, the big suburban house is gonna require uh, a lot more driving. So you're gonna spend a lot more time and money traveling. Would you rather live in a automobile dependent, uh, isolated uh, single family house, or in a more compact house in a walkable urban neighborhood? Uh, More than half the people surveyed say, yeah, I, I would give up my big lot a single family house and choose either a small lot single family or a townhouse or an apartment building if that is what it takes so that I can live in a a more accessible, uh, walkable neighborhood. So my conclusion is that improving walking and bicycling and public transit and increasing the amount of housing in those neighborhoods, so, so infill development that allows more families, especially working class families that struggle financially, to be able to find appropriate housing in those walkable urban neighborhoods, it benefits everybody. It benefits those households a lot, but it also benefits everybody else in the community because people who live in those neighborhoods, they're driving less and they're they're imposing less risk on others and they're producing less pollution, they don't require as much road space, Uh, they don't require as many parking spaces. So I believe that my research indicates that more multimodal planning, so that sustainable transportation hierarchy and smart growth policies that create more infill development and repairing suburban neighborhoods, so suburban neighborhoods become more multimodal, those are actually responding to consumer demands. They're, do, they're providing people, households with 
options they currently don't have. They want, but they don't have those options, such as affordable, more affordable housing and walkable urban neighborhoods. And the current trends, the demographic and economic trends are saying that that's even more important in the future. For example, John, do you, do you aspire to grow old? Do you hope that you can grow old? Already getting yeah. there. <laughs> exactly. And even though, you know, it might not be great to be old, it's better than the alternative, which is to die. So we want to grow old. And in planning, there's this concept of aging in place. If you read the magazines, especially magazines by like organizations like the, uh, the associate, uh, what do they call it? AARP, yes. AARP. Um, they'll often tell you, yeah, to prepare for your, your old age, you want to have a good insurance policy and a good retirement policy, and you want a house that can accommodate your, you in a wheelchair. And so there's a lot of talk about designing houses to be more comfortable for people with disabilities. My research emphasizes that we don't want to just have houses that accommodate people with disabilities. We want neighborhoods that are really good for people with disabilities, aging in place in your own community. And what does that mean? Uh, the most important thing is good walkability, that you feel safe, even if you're in a wheelchair or using a walker, that you would feel safe getting from your house to stores and parks and restaurants and pubs without a car, that it is convenient and it is, it is actually pleasant to get around your neighborhood by, by walking. So by walking and uh, associated modes like wheelchairs. Okay, so the question that every smart citizen to be asking their local officials is how well are you preparing for my future self, given the possibility that my future self is going to have some sort of mobility impairment? So I want I want sidewalks that are safe, sidewalks and crosswalks that are safe for wheelchair users. And there's a possibility that I'll, my future self will be impoverished. So maybe I, I don't have a car. I can't afford a car and I need compact affordable housing. I need uh, an apartment rather, I, I could no longer afford a full size house. So even if you are your a typical North American that lives in a single family house and drives everywhere, you still have good reasons to say that even though that's my current situation, I wanna prepare for our, our future, the future possibility that I'm gonna need non-auto travel and more affordable housing. Yeah. And uh, when we talk about uh, attractive housing and attractive places to live and, uh, you know, desirable places to live, uh, you know, I love this particular slide that you have, which is creating paradise. Paradise is not a destination. It's something that we create in our own communities. And uh, one of the, 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 you know, reoccurring jokes in urbanism is that, you know, people will travel to far flung places to experience walkability and beautiful uh, places. And, you know, and they'll come back and they'll rave with photographs of all these places and, and saying, you know, gosh, I, you know, it, it, that was such a, an amazing place. We never had to drive. We were able to walk everywhere, use transit, et cetera. But then when they come back home, sometimes there's that disconnect of, oh yeah, we could never do that here. But I think you're saying something a little bit differently here. It's like, well, we, we can create something in our own communities. It, it's very much what you point out. In urban planning, it has some very specific implications. For the last uh, century, the assumption was that paradise was a suburban location and that we all wanted, we all wanted to move out of the city into this you know, bucolic uh, countryside, and and that meant a bunch of suburban growth. Now, in order to live at the urban fringe, you need lots of driving. You're going to drive a lot. Uh, and all that driving is going to spoil those walkable urban neighborhoods in the city center that, that where you could live uh, with less uh, automobile travel. So one of the things that's come up 
one of the issues that's gotten a lot of attention recently is that for the la most of the last half century, departments of transportation, they built these urban highways that spoiled the urban, the walkable urban neighborhoods in most North American cities. And, okay, you could say the underlying uh, uh, political structure or factor was uh, it was driven by classism and racism. The assumption that uh, it was good to displace those what we would call slum uh, urban neighborhoods, but the the mechanism that transportation agencies used is that they recognized the increase in travel speed that those highways provided to the suburban residents the suburban motorists, but they totally ignored the loss of access, of multimodal accessibility that uh, those highways dis destroyed when they, when they displaced a walkable urban neighborhoods. So the, the people who lived in those walkable urban neighborhoods, they didn't need a car. They could get everything they needed within uh, a walk, or a bike ride, or a relatively short transit trip, because they were right close to the center of things. But then you you bring in a bunch of bulldozers and you build a bunch of highways in those that cut through those neighborhoods, and um, and and you're displacing all those households, and you're assuming the whole process was assumed that all those people were going to move out to the suburbs and lead a better lifestyle ignoring the fact that that meant they were going to have to spend far, far more money and far more time traveling. And for most, many of those people, especially lower income households, that made their life far worse. It was a huge harm. So this, this, um, this uh, new vision, we're beginning to to realize the value of accessibility. My research goes into quite a bit of detail for this. And in fact, one of my uh, projects uh, uh, that I completed a while ago is, called, was, is what's called the Commute Duration Dashboard. I did this with University of Sa California, San Jose uh, researchers, and we took the, um, the census data on commute duration and we heat mapped it. And so you can see how much time the average commuter spends getting to work in various locations. And unsurprisingly, at least to us familiar with these issues, people who live in the central neighborhoods spend far less time, like half as much time on average, getting to work as people who live in outlying neighborhoods in suburbs. It points out how foolish it was, how contradictory it was to destroy the central neighborhoods with highways in order to help suburbanites drive faster. Because overall, they end up spending far more time traveling because of that reduction in accessibility. So if we use accessibility-based metrics rather than mobility-based metrics, we would build far, far fewer urban highways, almost none. And we would spend those resources instead improving urban neighborhoods, making urban neighborhoods better for walking and bicycling, and significantly improving the efficiency of public transit. So a whole bunch of trips that are currently made by automobile would now go to public transit or walking and bicycling. And we would do a whole bunch to make it easier to live in those walkable urban villages where you can minimize the amount of time and money you spend driving. Yeah. And I was going to say, Todd, and I just put up on the screen here, uh, your slide, our fair share. And so you're talking about, you know, <laughs> investing money. And this really, I think, is a very, very impactful graph that you have here that talks about how uh, extraordinary and how <laughs> out of whack it is in terms of the majority of transportation investments are devoted to automobile transportation. Sure. And the and one detail to point out is that an awful lot of that subsidy is, is actually parking. It's not just roads. It's that uh, zoning codes in almost every community require property owners 
to spend a huge amount on off-street parking, forcing people who don't own a car or drive less than average to subsidize these expensive facilities uh, that they don't need. So you're forced to pay for a parking space you don't need because of current zoning codes. So we could do a lot to create a more equitable, fair transportation system by reforming our parking requirements and investing more in the non-auto modes. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I think it's really important too um, when we, I, I'm glad you had parking on there because it's it's like one of those things that we just don't think enough about. And when I say we, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about us in the bubble. We talk about it all the time and we think about it all the time. But outside the bubble of active mobility and urbanism, uh, it's not talked about at that much. Uh, Here you you have your your graph of external costs. Talk a little bit more about this because I think that's another thing that people don't really think about are these externalities. Right. So external costs are costs that one person, one activity imposes on other people. A lot of this is common knowledge, but has, but we don't usually present it. So uh, it's common knowledge, for example, that if somebody has a choice between, let's say, driving to work or taking the bus to work or maybe bicycling to work, that the person that chooses to drive is imposing more congestion delay on others. That's an example of an external cost. And uh, your decision, and also in imposing more risk, particularly on vulnerable road users, uh, walkers, bicyclists, and motorcyclists. And you can do the same with air pollution. Somebody choosing to drive is going to produce more air pollution than somebody uh, traveling by walking and bicycling, and usually public transit. So, and there's actually a number of studies that have put dollar values. They've estimated what would be the cost, the monetized cost, the monetary cost of those impacts? So how much, for example, would you have to pay to compensate people for the congestion delay or the air pollution or the parking subsidies that that are caused by driving? And how does that compare with other modes? And I think most people would agree, would, 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 would understand my analysis if I do these Uh, analyses individually. So if you look at just the congestion that somebody imposes when they decide to drive or just the accident risk or just the air pollution, what becomes really interesting is when you sum them up and you think about what are the total impacts. So there are many ways to frame this. One I like to think about is uh, what would be the benefits to you if your neighbor's drove less, owned fewer cars, drove less, and relied more on walking and bicycling and public transit. Even if you're a motorist, you would benefit, you could benefit if your community invested more in walking and bicycling and public transit and introduced what what we call transportation demand management, TDM incentives. So they encourage people to, to shift when they can. We're not saying everybody's got to give up driving altogether, but most people make a bunch of trips that if they are in the habit of, they'll make by car. That you know, it's time to go and do a, a little bit of shopping, and people get in their car and they drive. Even if there's a store that sells that product that's that's within, say, a ten minute walk, and if they had a little incentive, like if they had to pay for the parking at the sh- at the store, it'd be much n- more normal for them to walk or bicycle. Uh, those are the changeable trips. And so the research on external costs, or, or you could say the, the demand management benefits, the benefits of getting people to drive less, uh, that becomes a, a critical component for deciding what we should invest in. Yeah. And, and we sort of alluded to it earlier, too, is that a lot of those trips that we take um, are, in fact, incredibly Short, <laughs> you know, there, there may be, you know, uh, an individual may have, uh, you know, maybe one trip a day or two trips a day that are a longer distance, but many of the trips that we see, because we see a significant number of trips in most communities in North America, uh, somewhere between 40 to sometimes even 50% of, 
of total trips are inherently bikeable distances, for instance. And so, you know, going back to the analogy that we were using and talking about, you know, do you take the stairs or do you take the, the escalator? It's like, you know, we have to really truly make our networks, our mobility networks and our choices of options truly attractive and, and legitimate reasonable choices so that a pragmatic decision of, oh, should I, you know, I'm just going just down the road there. It's less than a mile. Maybe I can even walk. It's a beautiful day. Or it's just slightly more than a mile. Maybe, you know, hey, maybe I go for a bike ride because we've had this, you know, all ages and abilities network in place. And, you know, suddenly, it, you know, it is that much more attractive if you can layer on some additional incentives uh, that, that make that choice a little bit easier, all the better. Because then we do start to see, you know, modal shifts, which is, you know, kind of what we're talking about when we talk about TDM. Bingo. Exactly. So a lot of my research goes into detail about this, these, these issues. One of my newest reports is called Completing Sidewalk networks, benefits and costs. And it, it asks, simple question, you know, what portion of city streets have sidewalks? And it turns out in most cities, between 20 and 40% of streets don't have sidewalks or the sidewalks are in very bad shape. And yes, it would take some investment. It would take a, a, some money to complete those sidewalk networks and make sure they're all what we call ADA compliant, meaning that they can accommodate wheelchairs and walkers. What we find is currently most cities do not have straight inv direct investments in sidewalks. What they do is they say, anytime a property owner develops their property, they're required by law to add a sidewalk to the street, which is a terribly inefficient and often unfair way to uh, to build your sidewalk network. And that explains why many streets lack full sidewalks. We're waiting for all those properties to be developed. And many of the sidewalks that were built, you know, decades ago are not up to quality. So what my research finds is that most communities taking into account what governments spend and what private properties spend, that most communities uh, are spending somewhere around 40 or $50 a year per capita on sidewalks. And in order to, and, and we have some examples of some cities that have committed to update or to upgrade their sidewalk network, say within 10 years. And in order to do that, they essentially need to double that funding. They would need to spend, go from spending, let's say $50 a year per capita to $100 a year per capita to complete the sidewalk networks. And now, John, is that a lot of money? Is it, is, no, it's tiny compared with what we spend on roads yeah. and what we spend on parking subsidies and what we spend on our vehicles. So what my analysis, and, and there are some studies that have looked at what happens if you do complete the sidewalk network uh, and the crosswalk network, we do see more walking. It also is critical for allowing people to use public transportation because almost every transit trip includes walking links. And so sidewalks, completing your sidewalk network does allow households to reduce you know, the, the amount of uh, the money they spend on automobiles. And it allows businesses to reduce what they're spending on off-street parking for those motorists. And it reduces, it can reduce, uh, help reduce uh, the need to expand highways and roads, if, especially if it becomes part of your uh, public transit development. So there are huge savings and benefits. If we can make sure that any, any, every stri street has a complete sidewalk network, we're, it can pay for itself many times over. That's my the conclusion of my research. And that's validated here in our community. Uh, we have been spending quite a bit on sidewalks, but also on our bikeway network. So our bikeway network here in Victoria, uh, getting us back to, the, to where we started, you know, looking at those images of, of Victoria. Yes, Victoria has made, uh, we spent 
uh, in the last decade, about $35 million on bikeways in Victoria. Sounds like a lot of money. It turns out it's about $30, $40 annual per capita. If you look at $35 million over 10 years, so it's not that much money. And it's been part of, it, it helps explain why per capita vehicle travel has declined significantly. I'm not saying it's the only cause. There were other factors. And in fact, our ability to work at home, the increased use of telework and working at home has probably been the dominant reason that we're seeing reductions in automobile travel. But especially in the core communities, in the, in the urban, the denser neighborhoods, we're seeing an awful lot of bicycling and scooter use. And we're seeing, especially with e-bikes, the potential for, for walking and for bicycling just about doubles. So if in the past we predicted that, you know, if we fully develop our bikeway network, we might achieve 5% bike mode share. Now you should double that to 10, 10% with e-bikes. And one of my frustrations, you know, I'm, I'm a good environmentalist. I strongly support uh, environmental strategies, including fleet electrification. But it is frustrating to me that most uh, fleet electrifications, they begin and end with cars, and they will happily subsidize the purchase of a Tesla at five to ten thousand dollars. They will, they will, they will. There are if you if you include state, federal, and state and local subsidies for electric vehicles and vehicle recharging stations works out to be five to ten thousand dollars per vehicle, and yet. Most jurisdictions are not offering significant subsidies for e-bikes, for, for um, uh, micro modes. If they are, it's a tiny portion of the total fleet electrification subsidy or funding. And it usually runs out within a few days or months or weeks of when it is uh, opened. Uh, so uh, one of the, you know, we were talking about the, um, the, the, sustainable transportation hierarchy, one of the ways that should express itself, one of the first things we should do is make sure that fleet electrification subsidies go first, prioritize uh, micro modes first rather than last, and recognize that in order for people to take advantage of their e-bikes, they, they don't just need to buy an e-bike, they need facilities, bikeways, so that they can safely use them. Now, if you come to Victoria again, one of the fun things is to stand at the side of some of those bikeway networks and watch all of the people having enjoying those facilities, including a bunch of parents uh, with uh, cargo bikes and other extended bikes with their kids, bicycling their kids around, and people using electric scooters, which it's not, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's very affordable. It's good for the environment. And there's a fun factor there that I think uh, we need to take into account. People enjoy using their bikes and e-bikes and, and scooters. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think I just saw some uh, recent posts um, out on uh, out on the interwebs of uh, some new uh, bike lane uh, infrastructure coming into, uh, is it Fort Street Protected Bikeway there on, in Victoria? Right. Is that what, well, is we, that, what that is? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So Fort Street is the major uh, arterial between Victoria and Oak Bay, which is the wealthy suburb uh, just out past uh, Victoria. And... Um, we now have a fully protected bikeway that will provide that connection between Victoria and Oak Bay. And uh, it should be another transformative project where a bunch of people who are currently either unable or let's say it's a little intimidated by the idea of bicycling, you know, say they live in Oak Bay and they got to get to Victoria or, or something like that. 
they will now have a, a really nice, comfortable route. Uh, so I suspect that with that, we're going to see a significant uh, shift on that corridor. And that happens to be, that's part of that corridor, it also takes you to the University of Victoria. So we will now finally have a fairly nice bike route between the university and downtown. Uh, so everybody benefits, uh, even motorists will benefit from reduced traffic congestion and reduced need to chauffeur the non-drivers and their family as these alternatives develop. Yeah, well, uh, you can already guess that I want to book my return trip to come visit you and check out the expanding uh, bicycle network. Uh, it's always a pleasure to connect with you, Todd. Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast once again. It's my pleasure, John. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Todd Littman. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts. Uh, you can do so uh, out on Patreon, buy me a coffee, YouTube super thanks, that's right down below, <laughs> as well as uh, buying things from the Active Town store, including uh, good stuff like this, streets of people swag out there, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit. Uh, every little bit helps and is very much appreciated. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <music>